Well, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, wherever you are. Uh, many thanks indeed for joining us today. And welcome to this, the third webinar in the Toronto Centre series of webinars on the revised Basel Core Principles. Uh, I think we have more than 400 people registered for this webinar from 73 countries. So I hope as many of them as possible are able to join us today. Uh, my name is uh, Clive Brielt and I'm chair of the Toronto Centre Banking Advisory Board. Uh, since its establishment in 1998, Toronto Centre has trained more than 26,000 financial supervisors from 190 countries and territories uh, to build more stable, resilient and inclusive financial systems. And the Toronto Centre's mission is sponsored by Global Affairs Canada, uh, Swedish CEDA, the IMF and other of our valued international partners. And today, uh, we're going to focus on risk management and business model sustainability. Uh, in these areas, the revisions to the Basel Core Principles published in April this year uh, place greater emphasis on banks' corporate culture and values as a key element of strong risk management practices. They also cover for the first time the need for banks to adopt and implement sustainable business models and for supervisors to assess business model sustainability. To discuss these important issues, I'm delighted to welcome our two speakers today, who I'm sure will bring a wealth of insights and expertise. Elsie Addo Awadzi is Deputy Governor of the Bank of Ghana and a board member of the Toronto Centre. Will Byrne is Managing Director of Supervision Methods, Standards and Controls at the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions, OSFI, in Canada. And their full biographies can be found in the registration pack for this webinar. Uh, we're going to run this webinar in two parts, the first focusing on culture and values, and the second on business model sustainability. Uh, our speakers will open each part, and then there will be some time to answer as many of your questions as we possibly can. So do please send in your questions as we go along using the question and answer function on your Zoom screen. Uh, in case you haven't already noticed, we are offering translation of this webinar into both French and Spanish, uh, but I would be grateful if you could possibly ask your questions in English. Uh, and I'm going to ask Will to open the discussion on culture and values, uh, placing this within the wider context of good risk management. Uh, he and then Elsie will also cover their experience in supervising the culture and values of financial institutions in their respective jurisdictions and the measures that supervisors can take that may lead to stronger culture and values within financial institutions. So, Will, over to you first, please. Thank you, Clive. I'm very happy to be here today for the conversation with you and Elsie, and I'm looking forward to the questions that we'll get from participants. So an institution's culture can influence decision making and its risk taking. And that means that culture can materially support or alternatively weaken the resilience of regulated institutions, especially in fast moving and uncertain risk environments. At OSFI, we've always recognized the critical role played by the board of directors and the centrality of effective risk governance in achieving sound prudent supervisory outcomes. Ultimately, it's the board that's responsible for an organizational culture that underpins the success of risk owners and oversight functions. And there isn't an ideal culture. Sound culture depends to some extent on context. But that said, all cultures should reflect a commitment to norms that encourage ethical behavior. OSFI has a draft guideline on culture and behavior risk and according to that guideline, we expect institutions to define their defi define their desired culture and then continuously evaluate and respond to behavior risks that could impact overall safety and soundness. So in other words, culture should be deliberately shaped 
evaluated and maintained. We're starting to see that culture and other non-financial risks are better integrated into institutions' risk management frameworks. Boards are paying more attention to the role of culture in influencing risk-taking behavior. I'd like to talk briefly about incentives and accountability. So incentives are uh, a very important part of the culture equation because compensation is a powerful tool to encourage the right risk behaviors and also discourage the wrong ones. And in Canada so far, we've taken a principles-based approach to compensation reform, uh, consistent with our broader approach to prudential regulation. Turning to accountability, um, which also underpins effective risk culture, as part of our new supervisory framework that became effective in April of this year, we're communicating additional information to institutions to provide them with greater clarity about risks and desired outcomes. And we're finding that this clarity is helping equip boards to ask tough questions of their senior management teams and hold them accountable. So to sum up, it's a combination of incentive structures and accountability measures that you need to support effective risk management. And I'd like briefly just to mention a speech that our Deputy Superintendent Ben Gully gave last month. The title of that speech was before, uh, Promoting Effective Risk Governance, No Time for Complacency. In that speech, Ben went into much more detail about risk governance, including the top 10 behaviors and tendencies that we see in effective boards of directors. And I'll put a link in the chat in a moment. Over to you, Clive. Okay, well, thank you very much for those uh, introductory remarks, Will. Um, over at this point to Elsie to add her thoughts on uh, culture and values. But just in the meantime, as far as I can see on my screen, uh, no one's yet put a question up. So if you do want to ask questions of our uh, illustrious panelists today, uh, do please put your questions in the uh, Q&A box on Zoom. Uh, Elsie, over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Clive, and uh, thanks for having me uh, for this very important conversation. Good to be here with yourself and Will. Uh, so, as you said, culture and values, has, and, and as Will said, um, have become really important parts of overall risk um, governance and risk management of any regulated financial institution. And um, we at Bank of Ghana strongly uh, believe that. Um, we believe that uh, for supervisors, this is in increasingly becoming very important. Uh, although we see challenges there also, supervisors traditionally um, have been trained to look at numbers, right? Uh, and, and basically uh, quantitative metrics have been very important in supervision. So if a, if a bank, um, has the right kind of capital adequacy ratio, and perhaps MPLs uh, are in the region where you want them to be, and profitability is where you want it to be, um, you tend to gloss over what the story is behind those numbers, right? Um, and sometimes the, the, you know, the numbers don't look as good, uh, but, but supervisors in the past had not probed further, interrogated those numbers to understand what really are the underlying cultural and value systems at play. Um, and so we'd, we've taken a very, very, um, very critical look at this and are enabling our supervisors to begin to have conversations uh, with banks to better understand the stories behind the numbers um, and really how banks are positioning themselves uh, in terms of culture and values to drive the numbers that, that we're seeing uh, for good and, and, and for bad. Uh, underlying all of this is the fact that we're taking a more longer term view to say, um, you know, let's, let's understand how these value systems and these cultural norms um, and practices in the end um, help to build safe and sound institutions or otherwise. And, and let's do something about it while we can right, to reshape uh, these conditions. Um, and so some of the things that we've been interested in, in looking at has been, um, as Will said, risk, uh, excessive risk taking and, and basically understanding how banks are lending, um, what's the culture when it comes to um, how bank executives are 
remunerated and how that might incentivize um, you know, one kind of culture or, or value system or the other, um, how banks are reporting themselves. Are they being truthful in their reporting? Is there a culture of sweeping things under the carpet uh, until too late? W what are the bank's own internal early warning systems uh, you know, for picking up uh, things that don't seem right? And, and how are these uh, sort of peculated up? Um, is there a whistleblower system in place? Um, how are they, how are whistleblowers treated in the end, you know, and, and et cetera. Consumer protection is also one thing that we look at very carefully. Um, how are customers of the bank treated? What is the value system and the culture around how customers are treated? Uh, what all sorts of customers. And, and along these lines, we're also very much promoting ESG principles, um, environmental, social governance principles that include inclusion. Financial inclusion is a big imperative for us as well because half of the population is outside the banking system. But that sometimes is a result of um, a customer operating in the informal sector or operating a small business, um, walking up to a bank branch and not, get, and not getting um, access to a bank account, even though they may have all of the documentation in place, just because you're treated as well. Uh, you're too small to matter to us, right? We don't really care about you and stuff like that. And then this also leads to sort of unfair pricing of products and services, uh, lack of transparency in lending uh, agreements, um, and, and even how customer accounts uh, are charged fees and all of that. So basically we look at this from um, all these angles, again, looking at it from the role of the boards and how they set the tone at the top, uh, but also how even at the branch level, um, you know, these values and cultures are playing out. Uh, and so our supervisors are empowered not only to deal with the top, but also to deal um, at every level. Uh, and as we go along, I'll share a bit more uh, specifics as to some of our uh, experiences. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much indeed, Elsie. Um, also, thanks to Will. Um, he has put a link up in the chat function uh, to a speech by Ben Gully uh, that he mentioned. Uh, I'm pleased to see that we do now have a question uh, in the in the Q and A, and it's from Risha, who is a program director at the Toronto Centre. Uh, she's posed it as a question to Will, but I think it's also equally relevant to uh, Elsie and covers some of her remarks about the board. Uh, and the question was really, how can boards prevent excessive risk taking and aggressive selling practices by financial institutions? Uh, and perhaps we might just broaden out the question a little bit. So it's not just about how can boards do that, but how would you expect a supervisor to know uh, and discover whether or not a board uh, is actually doing the right thing here? So, uh, Will, I think over to you first, please. I think it comes round to um, risk governance around uh, policies and procedures for undertaking business and making sure that there's a balanced performance scorecard um, for for staff so that they're not unduly pursuing growth over um, other considerations. Okay, thank you. and. and just to just to feed on from that as to what you would expect supervisors therefore to be looking at to uh, assess whether that's really happening or not. I think it's comparing what they're seeing in terms of performance. And this, this is an interesting question because there's a segue between the two topics that we're talking about today. So there's business risk and risk management. And this is uh, touching on both of both of them. But what has um, the uh, the board approved strategy and plan, um, and then compare that to performance, and understanding how things are uh, are diverging and whether the um, the performance of the institution is aligned with the strategy that's been approved. Okay, thanks, Will. Um, Elsie, anything you wanted to add to that? You mentioned in your remarks uh, that you expected your supervisors to be having conversations with members of the board and senior management. So. You know, what do you think they should be looking for in terms of 
how the board can prevent excessive risk taking and aggressive selling practices. Sure. So I totally agree with Will. I think the board, the bank strategy is is one place to look at. What what does what are the goals the bank itself has set? Are these reasonable? Are these practical? Right. Um, so that's number one. Remuneration policy is also a big giveaway. Um, what are what are and basically sort of performance uh, appraisal systems. What are people held accountable for? And what are the expectations um, of staff members, right? Uh, basically, because sometimes I find that um, excessive selling and stuff like that uh, really uh, is even been done at the blind, on the blind side of management or the board. But just because people are being held to very uh, high targets, you know, and, and and stuff like that, and 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 the board cannot say they don't understand that um, sort of targets that are set so that are unrealistic will lead to such behavior and and so uh you want to look at what what how people are assessed for 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 what kind of performance and how that leads to remuneration policy what gets rewarded basically um uh, the other thing i want i want to stress has to do with the fact that um sometimes we have seen here that high staff turnover is a big indicator uh, and we were seeing it in the case of a few banks, uh, excessive staff turnover. And, 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 and this, as we began to investigate and interrogate, we realized that a lot of staff members were getting burnt out because they were being uh, made to meet um, extraordinary targets. Like, you know, you need to increase deposits by so much in, in a particular month. <laughs> you need to increase loan, uh, you know, lending portfolios by so much. You need to increase this portfolio by so much. You know, profits must go to this level. All of these totally unrealistic. But what this means is that staff members that then are on their own to devise their own individual strategies right, to try and meet these targets. Eventually, some of them who cannot do it will just quit. But those who stay might then be adopting all sorts of strategies that are not clearly aligned with the overall corporate strategy, but you cannot call it an unintended consequence anyhow. So yes, the boards and senior management must be very aware um, of, of, of intended and unintended consequences of, of strategy and targets and, and, and performance metrics. All right. Okay, thank you very much for, El for that, Elsie. We have another question uh, from Sarah uh, asking how supervisors can best collect and collate the sort of qualitative information that you've both been talking about. Uh, yeah. And interestingly, not just for internal risk assessment uh, purposes, but also whether you publish any of those observations <laughs> in any way, perhaps as a you know, published thematic review of what you're seeing across your financial institutions. And perhaps it might also be the case, Will, that the draft guidance that OSFI has been working on, on cultural behaviours, uh, although not explicitly related back to what you see in the firms you supervise, uh, I imagine that actually that guidance is based in part uh, on what you've observed over the years around cultural behaviours. Uh, so I don't know which aspects of that. I think I've turned uh, a couple of parts of the question into about three parts. Sorry to confuse, but uh, Will, do you want to take take that one first? Uh, no, thank you. It's a very interesting question. And as we've kind of um, developed our approach around culture and behaviour risk, what we've been looking for are insights that can be actioned by supervisors. Um, and, and that's... Um, important because we're sort of evidence-based and we're wanting to engage with institutions and be clear about the outcomes that we're looking for. And one of the things that's helped us as we approach that work is to develop a taxonomy of culture risk that supports internal discussions about observations that, that we, we've, um, we've seen and, and then focus on the outcomes that we're looking for with institutions. So perhaps for an example, you know, we're, we're careful to avoid promoting any single type of culture, but we might be doing uh, work in a particular area, say for credit risk. And the findings that we have in that scenario, when we look at them, our conclusion might be that they relate to a, an element of culture risk, perhaps that there's a, a lack of vig vigilance in the way that the business is being carried out, or there's a fear of speaking up um, uh, 
it, uh, amongst the staff, and then we can call attention to, to that. Okay, thank you very much, Will. Um, Elsie, any thoughts on that? You said in your remarks that you were going to offer a few more observations about uh, what actually happens at the uh, front line when supervisors assess these things and feed it into the risk framework. So mm -hmm. anything you want to add? Yes, yeah, so unlike OSPI, we, we have not published like a taxonomy per se um, that would help with these conversations, but I think that's a brilliant idea. What we've done is issue a number of directives to banks, including uh, corporate governance directives, which embed uh, requirements for improving uh, corporate culture and values. Uh, we published the corporate governance disclosure requirement that also has banks reporting specifically on what they're including in their codes of conduct, uh, you know, for, for all levels of staff and their board members and et cetera. And so we hold them accountable to those, right? Um, and then we we look at complaints, customer complaints. We 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 capture, we sort of collect or collate um, all sorts of data points on customer complaints because banks are required to tell us when they receive customer complaints. And sometimes the customers come to us directly. We have a, a disputes resolution function, and and so. We're also able to collate these and sometimes publish some of these, you know, and then fraud, uh, fraud reports as well. And so all of us, all of these give us a picture of what's going on. And as Will said, when we look at the numbers, non-performing loan numbers, we're able to tell what the level of risk governance around credit underwriting is. Uh, when we look at excessive growth in 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 revenue lines, uh, you know, it's all relative. Uh, but if you compare year on year, quarter on quarter, we're able to trigger some conversations to say, you know, what's underlying these and what's at play. And and so it's a combination of things. We don't have a, a hardwired sort of um, formula for this, but uh, increasingly it's about judgment and it's about some very clear parameters that um, the banks know that we engage with them on. Okay, thank you very much uh, for those responses, uh, Will and Elsie. So another question has appeared from someone who prefers to remain anonymous, uh, but basically saying, you know, your answers make very good sense, obviously. Um, in the case of uh, banks and other financial institutions headquartered in your jurisdiction, uh, but what about the action of branches operating in your jurisdiction? Uh, where you may not have a board of directors to to focus on. Uh, Elsie, do you want to comment on that first? Um, I I will, and it's it's pretty easy because all in right. Ghana, all operations of foreign banks here are organised as subsidiaries. Okay, it's right. a basic requirement of our banking framework. So so it it kind of makes things a little easier for us. But even there, what we realise is that you tend to see a different kind of or culture could be very different depending on whether mm -hmm. uh, you're dealing with a subsidiary of a foreign bank versus if you're dealing with uh, a domestic bank and versus if you're dealing with a state-owned bank, for example, right? Or a bank that is listed on the stock exchange versus one that is not. And, and so culture, I mean, the conversations around culture and values can be quite uh, nuanced, you know, and it, it, it becomes quite evident, you know, which organization you're dealing with, depending on what you're seeing. So yes, we, we see differences, but we're, we we regulate and supervise them all the same because they're all subsidiaries. Okay, thank you. Will, any comment on branches quickly and then we'll move on? Our, our approach is quite different for branches because they're not legal entities. Um, so the approach is, is is different for branches there are specific expectations of the um the principal officer or the, or the um the principal uh get my terminology mixed up but the, it is a different approach for branches okay all right thank you um one more question uh come up from uh silviano uh asking if uh, one way of trying to get some information on culture and values and indeed probably other aspects of a firm's behavior uh, would be to have a supervisor uh, 
uh, sitting on the board of a systemically important financial institution. Uh, what do you think about that idea, uh, Will? I think that would be um, the the difficulty there is the loss of independence that would happen. So I don't, I don't think we would be supportive of the supervisor uh, sitting on the board. We, we okay. wouldn't be. Okay, loss of loss of who's independence? Will can you just clarify? The loss of the supervisor's independence if right. they were participating in the oversight of the institution directly. Okay, thank you, Elsie. I agree. I agree with yeah. Will. Totally. Okay. Um, there's a couple of questions actually appeared in the chat, uh, so I'm keeping an eye on that as well as Q and A. Uh, one of them uh, is actually around something you mentioned, Elsie. Um, ESG, environmental, social, and governance issues. Okay. Uh, basically, saying there's quite a lot of confusion about uh, what exactly that means and how exactly it's assessed, and therefore asking whether. Uh, there might be scope for entities to collaborate to provide the market with uh, a bit more guidance to overcome some of the miscommunication and inconsistencies around those terms, which which undoubtedly arises. Uh, Elsie, did you want to comment on that? I, I totally agree that there's a lot of uh, miscommunication and confusion around that. Uh, what we've done in Ghana at the Bank of Ghana is to publish industry guidance. So we, we have what we call the sustainable banking principles, all of these based on mm -hmm. ESG principles, uh, which are very clear in terms of what we believe banks should be doing. And we believe it's central to risk management. It's essential to, to, to culture and values. Basically, the idea that banks should be operating uh, clearly aware of environmental risks uh, in their own operations and in terms of how they engage with the market. Right. And and then um, when it comes to social norms, basically banks understanding and being more aware of, of, of inclusion, of ensuring that they, they're being inclusive in the way in which they operate, um, and both internally and externally. Um, and then and then the idea of governance is really that strong governance is required, effective governance is required to help banks uh remain sound and 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 uh and, and stable. And so we, we have published what this means and we require banks to disclose to us and report to us on a quarterly basis how they are complying with these principles. And we encourage them to also make, make these reports um, public so that their clients and the, and the public, especially those that are listed on the stock exchange, understand the extent to which uh, they're incorporating these, these principles and these values in their work. Mm -hmm. and and in a standardized manner so that you can compare across institutions. So I agree with the need for more guidance. There's a lot of guidance out there, frankly, though, but I think jurisdiction by jurisdiction, it might make sense to, to clarify what is meant by this. Okay, Will, anything you want to add on ESG guidance? We, um, we do have a climate risk guideline, but our approach to climate risk is to bring it back to our mandate, which is to think about you know the risks associated with climate uh, climate change and think about how that could affect uh, safety and soundness of the institutions that we supervise. So that's the perspective we we have when we look at climate risk. And there is a, a guideline that we have. Okay, thank you, Will. Um, a question in chat, uh, probably more specific to uh, Elsie. Uh, actually, um, which is, I think, basically asking, do you see any differences in culture across different types of bank? Uh, so domestic banks, uh, subsidiaries of foreign banks, uh, and also state-owned banks. I think this is, uh, this is something I mentioned. This is probably referring to an earlier point <laughs> I made. Um, Yes, you know, and that, that that there's actually a more fundamental reason why, at least from my experience. We often talk about the backstopping with the board, but I would challenge that view and say the backstops with the shareholders, ultimately. Uh, because what we've seen is that the shareholders have a big role to play, right, in all of this. And we have seen that when shareholders themselves um, 
belief in good values, you know, and uh, accountability and, and strong risk management, they themselves are aligned with the boards that they put in place uh, because shareholders are the ones that appoint the board members, right? And, and they hold the boards accountable uh, and so on and so forth. What we find is that when you have, at least in our context, subsidiaries of foreign owned banks tend to be strong when it comes to value systems and risk management and all of that, because they're typically playing to global standards and um, sort of group-wide risk management frameworks. And, and, and because their parent banks are subject to um, strong supervision from other parts of the world as well, uh, those parent banks exert some positive influence right, on the subsidiaries because they have to uh, report to their home supervisors on a consolidated basis and et cetera. Um, I, re I make the joke about when I used to work as a senior treasury dealer of Barclays Bank uh, early in my career, uh, I felt that we got more supervised by Barclays Bank PLC UK than we did by the, by the banking regulators in Ghana. Because every so often, for example, we'd have an audit team from, from the head office uh, from London you know, coming over to Barclays Ghana uh, to check uh, how we were conducting our treasury operations, right? Um, and so the shareholders themselves have a big role to play. Um, when you have state-owned banks, there's a tendency that persons appointed to the boards uh, may be more sympathetic to a government uh, agenda and very likely might exert pressure on management to conduct business a certain way that may not ultimately inure to the benefit of depositors or to the system as a whole. So these are tendencies and, and potential. Supervision can play a big role, yes, but I'm really talking about tendency. So you find that in our jurisdiction, the banks that have been here longest, uh, over 100 years, uh, are subsidiaries of foreign banks, right? And you find that every so often, indigenous banks might fail uh, because of pressures exerted by shareholders themselves. And so we have taken a very serious view of how we keep an, our eye on who becomes a shareholder, a significant shareholder of a bank in Ghana, because that's critical. And so that's really what I meant about seeing different cultures and, and, and value systems across the various segments of banks. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much for that, Elsie. Um, well, perhaps at that point, we'll we'll move on to the second half uh, of, this, of this webinar uh, and focus on business model sustainability. Uh, just before I do so, there was one request in the chat about sharing slides, and I guess that means the notes of the speakers. Uh, just to say on that, that there will be a transcript uh, of the webinar available, uh, and that'll be available on the Toronto Centre website, uh, I think, in a week or two's time. So if you are interested in seeing uh, the precise text of what's been said, uh, there will be that resource available to you. Uh, so we move on next to business model sustainability. Uh, I think it's fair to say that most supervisory authorities are only just starting uh, their work on this. Uh, so what I want to do is ask Elsie and then Will to describe what they are developing in this area, uh, how they intend to incorporate uh, business model sustainability analysis within their supervisory frameworks and how they intend to engage with the boards and senior management of financial institutions on this topic. Uh, so Elsie, over to you first, please. Thank you, Clive. So our, our current business um, risk-based um, supervisory framework already um, requires our supervisors to be mindful of the business models that banks operate, right? And, and based on the size of the bank, the sort of the uh, the locations, the regional spread or the geographical spread, the complexity uh, of its operations and et cetera, 
uh, to be able to assess business model viability. Um, so much of this was really on paper and in theory only, and we expected supervisors to do what they could. Uh, but in the last year or so, we have uh, began to develop a framework, uh, a more operational framework that provides uh, clearer guidance to our supervisors and to the industry as well as to how far we'll be going and what types of uh, matters or, or, or areas will be averted in our minds too. Um, it is still in draft, still work in progress. And so we haven't started rolling it out, uh, but we just felt that we needed a bit more operational uh, meat around it uh, so that there's more um, streamlined assessments of these. Underlying all of this is the fact that a bank could be doing well today, but if its business model um, isn't right, uh, it's it's really going to set it up for failure. And so why wait until it actually fails and that you can begin to have conversations now? Um, so we part of what we'll be looking at under this um, new framework would have to do with basically um, how the banks are set up in terms of how they generate their revenues, um, which which sectors of the economy they're most exposed to, um, and systematically so, um, how how they deploy technology, for example, the extent to which they deploy technology to uh, to to advance the operations, and in that context what kinds of vulnerabilities emerge, right? Just by virtue of, of the rely, excessive reliance on that. Um, what kinds of partnerships the banks are into uh, in, in, in the operations and basically having a clear view of what risks um, those pools as well um, uh, and so on and so forth. So this is early enough, but we expect that our supervisors are trained to be able to have these conversations and it's done more strategically um, how these business models are evolving, how uh, they contribute to risk or otherwise, and, and basically how they can be reviewed, um, you know, and um, repositioned so that banks are better able to survive um, going forward. What we're doing as well is thinking through if a supervisor arrives at judgment that a bank's business model uh, is high risk, what then does that leave us with? What tools do we have in place? What can we do about it, right? Uh, do we have the power supervisors to say, well, you've got to change your business model? And the bank says, well, the business model is ultimately a decision of the board <laughs> and shareholders. So why, why does the supervisor uh, tell us to change our business model? And what risks is the supervisor itself prepared to take, right, uh, along with this? Um, so do we say change your business model and, and how so? Do we predetermine what business model then you need to do? Or do we just say, these are excessive risks, you need to watch them and tell us how you intend to mitigate these risks, right? Uh, do we use a, a capital framework to uh, require the bank to provide additional oh. capital buffers in, you know, relative to the excessive risks that we see? Uh, do we have the power to say, um, you know, we think your business model is consistently so weak and so poor that we actually have doubts about the quality of your governance. And so we want to, remove your board member, <laughs> we're going to remove board members, we're going to ask you to change your key management personnel and all of that. So these are all very early conversations we're having in here. And um, we look forward to to framing things up in, in the not so distant future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much uh, indeed for that, Elsie, and giving us a flavor of where you are in terms of making progress on business model sustainability. Uh, Will, what about OSFI? Yeah, it was very interesting, Elsie, listening to you talk about it, because I think we have a similar perspective on the importance of business risk and some of the complications associated with supervising it. Um, it's, a, it's a really interesting topic. And I think while some elements are new, analyzing strategic and tactical business plans are time-honored um, 
part of supervision and it gained momentum after the global financial crisis as part of the impetus to follow the money and to put supervisors in a better position to talk about revenues and related risks in the context of an institution's strategy, um, capital, liquidity and governance. So um, as Elsie was saying, I think business risk is an important early indicator of increasing prudential risk because if an institution doesn't address business model problems, that can lead to a loss of confidence that then results in financial stress. So we want to equip supervisors to be able to identify business model issues and then respond appropriately by taking early corrective action. But in doing that, we're not looking for supervisors to become business analysts, but rather just to know the business, um, see the forest for the tree, so to speak, particularly around risk concentrations and dependencies to understand the reliability of earnings as a risk mitigant and also gain insights into risk governance effectiveness. And the topic's been an area of focus for us with the development of our new supervisory framework that I mentioned um, in the last segment. And with the new framework, we communicate our rating of business risk to the larger financial institutions, along with our overall risk rating and the rating of um, three other topics. So financial resilience, operational resilience and risk governance. And the ratings help us communicate the outcomes that we're looking for institutions to achieve. So for business risk, what we see that as the risk of viability relating to uh, an institution's business model, thinking about its strategy, risk appetite, and its ability to execute its plan. And we're also careful to emphasize that the board of directors is responsible for the business plan and strategy. So we don't want to cross the line and issue recommendations that direct an institution strategy. So very similar to what Elsie was talking about, um, if there was a concern about a concentration, our focus would be on the risk implications of that concentration. So for example, are we satisfied with financial resilience when we look at the exposures stressed in scenarios that are relevant to the macroeconomic backdrop? Has the institution got the right level of risk governance to manage those concentrations? So we could be looking at outcomes that are relating, for example, to capital or risk-based limits relating to concentrations. As we've seen from the revised core principles, this is a topic that's of high interest internationally, um, but there's not as much guidance on business model risk compared to traditional categories like capital, liquidity or governance. And Austria is participating actively in work that's being led by the Basel Supervisory Cooperation Group to help development, help develop assessment practices that supervisors can use to evaluate and respond to business risk. So while we're still in the early days of using our new supervisory framework, we are finding that the additional focus on business model sustainability is helping us engage with institutions and out highlight the outcomes that address prudential risks. So back to you, Clive. Okay, thank you very much for that, Will. And thank you uh, particularly there for mentioning at the end the uh, further work being undertaken uh, by the Basel Committee with a view to providing additional guidance. I'm sure that will prove to be extremely valuable for many supervisory authorities. Uh, there was a question, Will, from Nancy in Ghana uh, which I think was asked at the end of the previous part, but I think it relates to both risk management and uh, the assessment of sustainability. Uh, and it was basically about how how you would view the development of fintechs offering uh, financial services and products, uh, and in particular, how they interact with and have an impact on uh, the traditional banks. And perhaps in the context of uh, the analysis of business model sustainability, uh, that question becomes how you would think about the potential competitive threats to the incumbent banks from new entrants. Uh, and as a lot of countries have seen in recent years, there have been a lot of new entrants making use of financial technology in one way or another. And in some cases, beginning to eat away at some previously profitable banking activities. Uh, so, Will, do you want to comment on that specifically as part of your 
your analysis of business risk? Yes. So it, um, we kind of uh, see the impacts in a couple of different places. So often fintechs are third parties providing services to a regulated institution. So we have a, a framework to assess third party risk. And the, mm -hmm. the starting point is that the regulated institution remains accountable for the services that they've outsourced. And we expect them to exercise the right level of oversight and have access to the information for them to, to do that. Um, and as you say, Clive, there's an also business uh, model impact on regulated institutions as they compete with uh, fintechs, both within the regulated system and outside of it. So that was one of our objectives with uh, developing the business model rating was to assess the impact of disruption and also over time um, to accommodate institutions, regulated institutions with non-traditional business models and help us to assess risks related to, to those business models as part of our supervisory framework. Okay, thank you for that. Well, Elsie, anything else you wanted to add to this question about the impact of fintech and other uh, emerging uh, infrastructure? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, definitely. So, so just to add to what Will has said, it's really important for supervisors or banks to understand what additional risks that these uh, collaborations and partnerships bring about. I think I mentioned it in one of my earlier submissions. Um, these uh, third parties are playing a very important role uh, to, to get banks themselves uh, become more, more cost effective in the operations, right? And, and, and to do business that they earlier on may not have been able to do, or if, if at all, um, at very high cost. And in our parts of the world is also helping to reach the last mile of, um, of the population. And so it's, it's incredibly important, but it's also important for banks to understand what these uh, mean uh, and the supervisors to understand as well. Um, equally important is for supervisors and banks themselves to understand the implications of outsourcing, um, uh, in particular cloud-based uh, cloud banking services, which is now the norm, uh, and the role of third party and fourth, fourth party providers and how all of these relate to operational risk. And supervisors must understand uh, risk across the value chain. It's actually more complicated for bank supervisors now because they're not only dealing with uh, banks with direct risks, but they're dealing with what additional risks are these arrangements uh, bringing up from a third party, fourth party standpoint and what exactly uh, uh, are these doing and how do we mitigate these risks and at what level? At the level of the banks, at the level of the fintechs and, and, and cloud providers, and other tech providers. So it's become a little bit more complex for bank supervisors. Um, and, and I think that there needs to be continuous work, uh, understanding that ultimately comes down to safety and soundness of the banks and of the safety of depositors funds. And, and we need to keep our eye on that. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that, Elsie. Uh, another question that was asked about uh, liquidity uh, risk and the challenges uh, facing supervisors there, and perhaps again we could we could turn that into a question which also uh, focuses on the sustainability of business models, because uh, you've both mentioned uh, the importance of looking at revenues and earnings uh, following the money, uh, but you know given the recent examples of Silicon Valley Bank and Credit Suisse, which both failed uh, among other reasons. Uh, because of a lack of liquidity and just losing a lot of deposits uh, in a fairly short period of time. Um, how would you see something like liquidity being factored into uh, business model analysis? Uh, Elsie, do you want to go first on that one? Right. Um, I, I would say that the business model of a bank would have implications for its liquidity. And, mm -hmm. and and how it manages that liquidity. So basically, bank boards and senior management ought to understand the implications that uh, you know a particular business model would have in the in the particular environment which which it it, uh, it operates in. I, I'll give you an example. In Ghana, we saw that a lot of the banks were um, getting very exposed to the sovereign, uh, both in terms of the debt market on you know the bond market, the government bond market, right. 
um, as well as lending, um, as well as lending to private sector borrowers that were government contracted, right? And and that fast became a business model because these contractors get very fat and juicy contracts. They need banks to fund uh, implementation of these contracts, and then they would pay. Now it takes a supervisor who understands this to say, well. Half of your, your assets are in government bonds, right? You've got maybe half of your loan book in, in contractor loans. Um, if you have any problem with government's fiscal position, you're going to have <laughs> a double whammy. You probably might have, a, you're bearing a risk of government having to, to default on its bonds or restructure its bonds and, and you take a hit for it. And government may not be able to pay contractors, government contractors soon enough. And then it means that they might not be able to service your loans. So what are the, are the liquidity, the potential liquidity implications of this? And what additional provisions are you making, right? And, and what liquidity management backup plans do you have in place? Should any of these risks materialize? So that's just one example. And, and, and there are many other examples of business models and implications for liquidity. And, and this is exactly the type of conversations that we expect supervisors to have with banks. Okay, thank you very much. So, Matt Elsie, Will, anything you wanted to add on liquidity and uh, no, business I risk? I agree about the strong linkages be between the, the two. And I would also highlight that when you look at some of the examples you mentioned and you follow the facts back, the underlying issue is often a business risk one. So with SVB, the rapid growth without the right level of risk governance supporting that growth led to issues that then eventually became a, a liquidity crisis. But had there been a um, corrective action in response to the business risk that could have avoided the, the, the crisis. Okay, thank you for that, Will. Um, and an interesting question in chat from, from Jerry um, asking, uh, whether you would expect supervisors to be assessing the ability of the senior management of a bank uh, to adjust their business model uh, in the light of external shifts in the uh, environment in which they operate. Almost takes us back, I think, to some of the things that were, were being discussed when we we're talking about culture, values and behaviours. Um, Perhaps I could start with you, uh, Will, on this. Uh, is this yeah. is this an aspect of individual behaviour of senior managers that you've considered? I think that is highlights the linkage between business model risk and risk governance, and that you're looking for an institution to have the right governance in place um, to oversee its strategy and execution, and and when it encounters. Um, issues that it has the ability to res respond to those appropriately. Okay, thank you. Uh, Elsie? Uh, yes, exactly. We expect the, the boards to be able to do that. And really, uh, there's no good strategy without uh, scenario planning, uh, scenario analysis, and there's no good risk management, right, without understanding how you shift from one strategy or the other, uh, depending on your environment. In some of the environments that we're operating, small open economies where the macro environment is particularly um, sort of fast moving <laughs> and evolving, depending on external shocks, mm -hmm. it makes uh, bank strategy very susceptible to, to environmental change. And, and we do expect uh, bank boards to be very nimble in terms of how they think of strategy, in terms of how they think of evolving risks. If you have a scenario where in one quarter you have a currency depreciation, uh, which is very sudden and very high, you have inflation move very quickly, you have interest, interest rates move very quickly, um, you almost always have to go back to your strategy to see what you need to do differently, right? And what additional risks um, are going to play out because you're, your borrowers, for example, uh, may may completely um, sort of uh, struggle, you know, to keep up with their loans, and and sometimes there's a lagged effect of this, so you may not be seeing that in, immediately, uh, 
uh, but a good board will then begin to think of, of, of the future and see how best to reposition the portfolio, um, you know, and what additional provisions to make. Thanks. Okay, thank you for that, Elsie. Uh, and another question in the uh, Q&A box from an anonymous participant, but I think it comes back to something you were talking about earlier, Elsie, uh, in the sense that you've both mentioned uh, the need for supervisors to uh, approach business risk, business model sustainability uh, in a very sort of open-ended way and to be able to take account of a wide range of factors. Uh, I mean, given that one thing we know about supervisory authorities everywhere is that they face uh, limited, uh, scarce resources, um, you know, what, what can you do to develop the sort of capabilities that will be necessary to undertake good uh, business model sustainability analysis uh, as as this subject develops further. Uh, Elsie, something you mentioned earlier, so do you want to pick up on it first, please? Um, yes, so so a couple of things. In, in addition to making sure that bank boards themselves understand the risk implications of what they do, right? What banks, what banks contribute to the entire banking system. Uh, and therefore how they must be careful. Uh, bank supervisors need to be trained, need to acquire skills, uh, basic uh, financial analysis skills, but more and more uh, strong corporate governance, uh, awareness and training, um, strategy and risk management uh, capab capabilities will be, will be necessary. Uh, technology and the role of, of, of technology and finance and how that's disrupting banking business models and the risks um, attached to that and how those risks must, must be managed. Uh, but what we find is that, um, you know, having a unit within the supervisory team or a group in the supervisory team that is thinking of emerging risks and, and thinking of banking risks and how uh, these risks need to be managed. And, and these are usually multi-skilled, multi-disciplinary uh, teams, right? Um, usually what you don't always find in supervisory teams, but you, you need to bring them together, right? So that they're constantly thinking of risks and, and how to model risk and, and how to feed that into uh, all the work that supervision does. We're also finding that structured training programs for supervisors such as the one offered by the Toronto Center, the Certified Financial Supervisor Program, um, is doing a good job of not only giving supervisors technical skills, but it's doing a good job of helping supervisors to make judgment and to grow in their own personal leadership skills. That allows them to go sit with a bank CEO and have conversations about strategy, right? Uh, in a way that the bank CEO is receptive to, in a bank that the supervisor is also um, able to, to manage carefully. Uh, and so those increasingly, those are very important um, skill sets to acquire um, for, for supervisors. And, and we want to thank the Toronto Center for, for making that available to our supervisors. Thanks. Okay, thank you for your kind words on the Toronto Center there, Elsie, but even more so thank you for your comments on uh, the more general approach to building those capabilities of supervisors. Uh, Will, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, Elsie said it really well, um, and I, I would agree about the importance of having um, pro-risk um, and emerging risk uh, monitoring, and also work to build capabilities of supervisors. So we have, um, at OSFI, we've um, very focused on en enabling supervisors um, with the right skills and technology and data to help them do a really good job. And we've grouped those all together within one, one team. Um, it's called the Supervision Institute, but all, all part of that focus about helping supervisors uh, with uh, do a good job in a rapidly changing risk environment. Okay, thank you very much for that, Will. Uh, well, we've come uh, to the end of the uh, hour allotted for this webinar, and I don't want to uh, uh, exceed the uh, time slot available. So perhaps I could just close by saying, first of all, uh, thank you very much to Elsie and Will for their uh, 
very perceptive comments and their willingness to answer as many questions as we were able to get through. Uh, thank you also to the translators uh, for providing the uh, proceedings in uh, French and Spanish to those uh, wishing for that. And thank you also, of course, to you, the participants in the seminar for, uh, for signing in and coming along and for the excellent questions that you've been asking. Uh, thank you for thank you for all of that. And I'm, I can only apologize if we didn't have time to answer all of your questions, but I think we managed to answer most of them. Um, so finally, thank you also to Toronto Centre for organizing the webinar. And as I say, this was the third one in a series on uh, the new revised Basel core principles. Uh, and I think there may be a couple more in the pipeline. So keep an eye out for that. And as I said earlier, if you have missed uh, the previous two uh, webinars, uh, I think they are available both as recordings and transcripts uh, on the Toronto Centre website. So if you're interested in pursuing that, please do so. Uh, so thank you all very much. I hope I haven't missed anyone to thank. Um, and at that, that point, the webinar is uh, duly closed. Thank you very much.